Who are the 24 elders? Beyond our understanding and perception lies a magnificent throne room in heaven, radiant with divine light and power. This place is really special. It's where the most powerful being in the universe lives. John's journey to the island of Patmos and his subsequent visions, including that of the 24 elders, is one of the most intriguing episodes in the Bible. Amidst the wonders of this supernatural realm, a particular presence stands out, a circle of 24 elders, robed in white, crowned with gold, sitting on thrones encompassing the main throne. Who are these figures? Why are they here? But who are these 24? What role do they play in judgment and redemption? And what can their presence teach us about our place in the grand narrative of existence? Dive deep with us into the mysteries of the book of Revelation as we seek to understand the significance of the 24 elders, their role in the heavenly realm, and the final chapters of human history. Apostle John tells us about the 24 elders. Apostle John was a prominent figure in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the visionary book of Revelation. He was a close companion of Jesus, part of his inner circle alongside Peter and James. This John was not the same as John the Baptist. Exiled on the island of Patmos by Roman authorities, John faced isolation and hardship due to his unwavering faith and his tireless work of spreading the message of Jesus Christ. He faced persecution. The aim was to silence him and his powerful teachings, banished him to the island, a small rocky and desolate place in the Aegean Sea. This was common during those times exiling troublesome individuals to isolated islands. Yet in this challenging time, he received profound visions from God, leading to the writing of Revelation. He described himself as a fellow sufferer for Christ, emphasizing perseverance in faith. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. The Vision of the 24 Elders After addressing the seven churches, suddenly John found himself in the very throne room of God. He saw God seated on a throne there, looking like precious gemstones. Surrounding this throne were 24 other thrones, and on these thrones sat 24 elders. These elders wore white robes with golden crowns on their heads. John has an encounter with 24 elders. If we could ask an angel who could interpret for us, who are the elders, it would be really useful. There are at least 13 views of their identity spanning from the 24 ruling stars or judges in the heavens to a straightforward representation of completeness and comprehensiveness. The elders are always associated with the four living creatures. There are 12 months in a lunar year, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, 12 gates in the New Jerusalem, 12 angels at each gate, 12 foundations, 12,000 sealed from each tribe, and so on. In the Bible, 12 appears to represent the number of divine governments. There is undoubtedly a connection between the significance of the number 12 and that of its multiples, such as 24 or any other multiple. Thrones are related to the heavenly powers in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, things visible and invisible, 
whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created and exist through him, that is, by his activity and for him. The entire scene was one of unimaginable splendor, worship, and adoration. The elders, along with the four living creatures around the throne, fell before God, casting their crowns before him and declaring, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 This event on Patmos was just the beginning of a series of spectacular visions John would receive, which he recorded in the book of Revelation. Through these visions, God unveiled the culmination of human history and the ultimate triumph of good over evil. There is no place in the book of Revelation where the 24 elders' identities are laid out in detail. On the other hand, it is highly likely that they are representatives of the church. Some people believe that they are angelic beings. However, this is highly unlikely to be the case. It is clear that they reign alongside Christ because of the fact that they are seated on thrones. It is proclaimed again and over again that the church rules and reigns with Christ. Revelation chapter 2 verses 26 through 27. And he who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God, and he who keeps my deeds, doing things that please me until the very end, to him I will give authority and power over the nations, and he shall shepherd and rule them with a rod of iron, as the earthen pots are broken in pieces, as I also have received authority and power to rule them from my Father. Revelation chapter 5 verse 10 You have made them to be a kingdom of royal subjects and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. In addition, the Greek word that has been translated here as elders is never used to refer to angels. Rather, it is only ever used to refer to men, and more specifically, men of a certain age who have reached maturity and are capable of ruling the church. Angels do not experience the effects of aging, hence we cannot use the term elder to describe them. Although angels can be seen wearing white, the color white is more frequently associated with believers because it represents the righteousness of Christ that is ascribed to us at salvation. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5 He who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God will accordingly be dressed in white clothing and I will never blot out his name from the book of life and I will confess and openly acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels, saying that he is one of mine. Revelation chapter 3 verse 18 I counsel you to buy from me gold that has been heated red hot and refined by fire, so that you may become truly rich, and white clothes representing righteousness, to clothe yourself, so that the shame of your nakedness will not be seen, and healing salve to put on your eyes so that you may see. The elders are wearing golden crowns, which is another indication that they are not angels. Angels are never given crowns, and no evidence has ever been found of angels actually wearing them. The term that is translated here as crown alludes to the victor's crown, which is worn by those who have contended effectively and won the victory, as Christ promised. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 Fear nothing that you are about to suffer. Be aware that the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested in your faith, 
and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful to the point of death, if you must die for your faith, and I will give you the crown consisting of life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8 In the future, there is reserved for me the victor's crown of righteousness, for being right with God and doing right which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that great day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved and longed for and welcomed his appearing. The bowls that the twenty-four elders in Revelation 5 are seen to be holding provide another justification for viewing them as representations of the church. Revelation chapter 5 verses 8 through 10 And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, Christ, each one holding a harp, and golden bowls full of fragrant incense, which are the prayers of the saints, God's people. And they sang a new song of glorious redemption, saying, Worthy and deserving are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. For you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of royal subjects and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. The cherubim, living creatures, serve as a motivation for the twenty-four elders to engage in worship. Because the cherubim worships God at all hours of the day and night, the elders do as well. The four living creatures are also found in Ezekiel. The cherubim, also known as the four living creatures, meaning beings, are the highest and most exalted order of celestial beings. This is made abundantly clear by the close proximity of these individuals to the throne of God. According to Ezekiel 1, it seems as though they are continually moving around the throne. Revelation chapter 5 verses 6 through 14 explains the functions or responsibilities of the four living creatures. They prostrate themselves before the Lamb, who is Jesus Christ, and offer the same reverence to Him as they did to the Father, proof positive of the deity of Jesus Christ. Along with the twenty-four elders, they have harps and golden vials full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They have harps and golden vials full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they are accompanied by twenty-four elders. In the Old Testament, harps are frequently associated with worship. Harps are also associated with prophecy. The purpose of the four living creatures also has to do with declaring the holiness of God and leading in worship and adoration of God. Additionally, the four living creatures play a role in the execution of God's justice in some fashion. These beings are an exalted order of angels whose purpose is primarily that of worship. Revelation chapter 19 verse 4 and the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Alleluia. The elders symbolically presented the prayers of the saints. On the other hand, they did not act as mediators for the people of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, the Bible informs us, that there is only one God, and that the only one who may mediate between God and people is Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 For there is only one God, and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. Elders are seen as representatives of God's people, particularly in the Old Testament. They are adorned with the crowns of victory and have moved on to the location that their Redeemer has prepared for them. 
John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Do not let your heart be troubled, afraid, cowardly. Believe confidently in God and trust in Him. Have faith, hold on to it, rely on it, keep going and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, because I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and I will take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. And to the place where I am going, you know the way. Roles and Responsibilities The 24 elders, as described in the book of Revelation, have distinct roles and responsibilities, primarily centered around worship and service to God. Here is a breakdown of their duties. Number 1. Worship One of the primary roles of the 24 elders is to worship God continually. They are often depicted falling down before the throne of God in reverence and adoration. The 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. God is honored by the 24 elders, which verbally translates to credit worth or worthiness to God. As they laid their crowns in front of the throne, the elders gave God the glory for their own work as well as the reward they had earned. They were able to see that the worth and the worthiness did not lie with themselves, but rather with God. We read, Casting the crowns simply acted out their declaration, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. If God was worthy of the glory and honor and power, then He should get the crown. There is also a reference to a custom that existed during the Roman Empire. The Emperor of Rome exercised authority over many lesser kings, and these kings were frequently required to pay tribute to the Emperor by presenting themselves before him and placing their crowns on the ground before him. After then, he would hand them back to them as evidence that he was the one who had given them their crowns, their right to rule, and their victory. The crowns mentioned in Revelation chapter 4 verse 10 are the Stephanos crowns of victory, not royalty. These are the crowns of achievement that a victorious athlete in the ancient Olympian games would receive for their accomplishments. The 24 elders representing all the redeemed of God through every achievement reward back to God because they knew and proclaimed he was worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. There are no differing points of view in heaven, nor are any groups or factions, and there are no divisions. They are all getting along wonderfully and singing in perfect harmony. What one person does others also do. Everyone did so in front of the throne, and they did it with their crowns. We are also told why the 24 elders praise God. We read, For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The 24 elders praised and adored God due to the power and grandeur of His creative ability. The fact that God is Creator gives Him all rights and every claim over everything, even as a potter has all rights and claims over the clay. Romans chapter 9 verse 21 Does the potter not have the right over the clay to make from the same lump of clay one object for honorable use, something beautiful or distinctive, 
and another for common use, something ordinary or menial. Worship is the appropriate reaction to God's magnificence. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, Christ, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of fragrant incense, which are the prayers of the saints, God's people. And they sang a new song of glorious redemption, saying, Worthy and deserving are you to take this scroll and to break its seals. For you were slain, sacrificed, and with your blood you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of royal subjects and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worship is the appropriate reaction to God's magnificence, which the 24 elders illustrate. Number two, singing praises. The elders play a role in declaring the worthiness of God, often through songs of praise. Their songs emphasize God's majesty, power, and the redemption he has brought about. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Number 3. Offering Prayers Representing the prayers of the saints, believers on earth, the 24 elders hold golden bowls full of incense. This symbolic imagery paints a picture of the prayers of God's people ascending to Him as a pleasing aroma. The elders serve as intermediaries, presenting these prayers before God. In summary, the 24 elders play a pivotal role in the heavenly realm by continually worshiping God, singing praises about His redemptive works, and offering up the prayers of believers on earth. They represent God's people, reflecting both worship and intercession. The Importance of the 24 Elders Let us break down the overall importance of these mysterious figures based on the given points. The Eternal and Majestic Nature of God's Throne Room The very setting where the 24 Elders are found is the Throne Room of God, an exalted and awe-inspiring place. Whenever they're mentioned, it's in the context of worship and reverence. Their presence is a testament to God's domain's grandeur and eternal nature. The elders not only worship God, but also acknowledge the Lamb, Jesus Christ, emphasizing His sacrifice and His central role in the redemptive narrative. Their acknowledgement of both the Father and the Son highlights the intertwined nature of God's sovereignty and the sacrificial act of the Lamb. In simpler terms, the 24 elders show us how grand and timeless God's royal court is. They constantly worship and thank God, showing us how vital these acts are in heaven. They highlight the main story. God rules everything, and Jesus' sacrifice is central to God's big plan. This is a broad and simplified outline. The book of Revelation, where the elders are described, is one of the Bible's most symbolically rich and debated books. One might dive deeper into each passage and consider various commentaries and interpretations to fully understand. Jesus will reign victorious and defeat his enemies, yet it is important to remember that the Church will also be fighting alongside our King and Savior. The Church has an extremely important role in the future and the present. Our responsibilities include sharing the Gospel, disciplining other believers, and living for Jesus. In the future, we will have more responsibilities of serving the Lord. 
While we don't know the full extent of our service, we know we will serve the Lord for all eternity. The cherubim cherubs are angelic and mentioned in the Bible several times. However, what are their purposes? In the Bible, we see at least two purposes. Number one, guardians. After Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden, God placed cherubim and a flaming revolving sword to guard the road to the Tree of Life. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 So God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he permanently stationed the cherubim and the sword with a flashing blade which turned round and round in every direction, to protect and guard the way, entrance, access to the Tree of Life. The cherubim are the first of the angelic hierarchy to appear in the Bible, immediately following Adam and Eve's fall from grace. After the great fall of Adam and Eve, we meet the cherubim. It became futile for Adam and Eve to expect righteousness, life, and happiness under the first covenant they made with God, as it was irreparably broken, and no benefit could be taken from it anymore. In this mention, this is the last historical mention of the Garden of Eden in the Bible. God assigned a detachment of cherubim for the specific duty of guarding. Adam was forbidden from approaching the Tree of Life by force or by stealth, as no one can make a pass against an angel on guard. We are three chapters in the Bible, and here we meet the great purpose of these angels. We don't know Adam's reaction to witnessing those glorious cherubim for the first time in human history. Perhaps awe, fright, and wonder are all emotions that come to mind. When we study the Old Testament, for instance, we find that angels are mentioned 108 times. In total, the word angel or angels appears in the books of the law the writings of Moses 32 times. These cherubims are real beings. They are not mythical figures or opinions. They are spiritual personalities that have a physical impact. That the way to the tree of life was shut up namely, that way which at first he was put into, the way of spotless innocency. It is not mentioned in the Bible that the cherubim were set to keep Adam and his descendants for eternity from the tree of life. We are grateful that God has prepared a paradise for us, where a tree of life will be present, and we can rejoice in the hope of it. However, the cherubim were appointed to prevent Adam and Eve from accessing the tree of life from the way they used to before they sinned. As much as Adam yearned to return to the Garden of Eden, the cherubim reminded him that he had broken God's law. The high priest of Israel would be allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year to gaze upon the mercy seat. Number 2. Bears of God's Throne Chariot Yahweh was characterized as the one who is enthroned, in Hebrew, sits, on the cherubim. Because God made himself known to Moses, from between the two cherubim mounted at opposite ends of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 2 And David arose and went with all those who were with him to Balea Judah, kiriath Jerem, to bring up from there to Jerusalem the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of the Lord of hosts, who dwells enthroned above the cherubim. David and all Israel went up to Balea, that is, to kiriath Jerem, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, the Lord who sits enthroned above the cherubim, the Ark which is called by his name. 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 6 The place where God sat on the outstretched wings of the cherubim was called the chariot. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verses 17 through 18. 
and the forks, the basins and the pitchers of pure gold, and for the golden bowls with the weight for each bowl, and for the silver bowls with the weight for each bowl, and for the altar of incense refined gold by weight, and gold for the model of the chariot of the cherubim that spread their wings and covered the ark of the Lord's covenant. In the vision that Ezekiel had, Yahweh was depicted as being seated on a throne chariot that had four wheels and was capable of moving in any direction. The wheels were in tandem with the cherubim. Ezekiel chapter 10 verses 16 through 17 Now when the cherubim moved, the wheels would go beside them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to rise from the earth, the wheels would remain beside them. When the cherubim stood still, the wheels would stand still, and when they rose upward, the wheels would rise with them. For the spirit of the living beings was in these wheels. In the book of Ezekiel, the throne chariot with the cherubim was perceived as a storm cloud on which Yahweh rode. Similarly, in Psalm number 104 verse 3 and Isaiah chapter 19 verse 1, Yahweh is said to use clouds as his chariot and ride the swift clouds, controlling the weather much like the storm gods in Canaanite myths. Isaiah chapter 19 verse 1 The mournful, inspired oracle, a burden to be carried, concerning Egypt. Listen carefully. The Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence, and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. In two parallel poetic passages, Yahweh is depicted riding on a flying cherub. This does not equate cherubim with clouds. The first is Psalm number 18, verse 10. And he rode upon a cherub, storm, and flew, and he sped on the wings of the wind. The second is 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 11. He rode on a cherub and flew. He appeared upon the wings of the wind. The cherubim are intimately tied to the throne of God. We see this when God provides details about the ark. They are also closely associated with fire. Not only were the cherubim found in close relationship with the flaming sword when they protected the Garden of Eden, it is reported that the cherubim walked among stones of fire on the holy mountain of God, which may be a reference to God's presence. Ezekiel chapter 28 verses 14 through 16. You were the anointed cherub who covers and protects, and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire, sparkling jewels. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created, until unrighteousness and evil were found in you. Through the abundance of your commerce, you were internally filled with lawlessness and violence, and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you out as a profane and unholy thing from the mountain of God, and I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Ezekiel in his vision saw God, the cherubim, and the throne chariot in terms of a thundercloud spewing lightning and having a rainbow. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 4 As I looked, I saw a stormy wind coming out of the north, a great cloud with fire flashing continually from it, and a brightness was around it. And in its core, there was something like glowing amber-colored metal in the midst of the fire. Coals of fire were seen between the cherubim and the wheels of the divine chariot. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 6 It came about when he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Take fire from between the whirling wheels, from between the cherubim. The man entered and stood beside a wheel. 
burning coals were taken from there to be spread in judgment over the city of Jerusalem. While the seraphim utilized hot coals to purify the lips of God's servant, the cherubim dispensed them at God's command as an act of judgment. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 2 And the Lord spoke to the man, seventh angel, clothed in linen, and said, Go between the whirling wheels under the cherubim. Fill your hands with coals of fire from between the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he entered as I watched. The cherubim surrounding God's throne, covered with their wings, pictured in the mercy seat of Exodus chapter 25 verse 20, the representation of God's throne. Satan was one of those covering cherubim, not simply one cherub among many. He was the cherub par excellence. The Bible states the existence of spiritual beings created by God, which may assume physical form for particular purposes. These creatures may be classified into two categories. Those in proper relationship with God are generally called angels or messengers, and those in rebellion against God are referred to as demons. While the living creatures of Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 5 through 28 are to be equated with the cherubim of Ezekiel chapter 10. On the other hand, the living creatures in Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 9 resemble cherubim in that they have facial features of the same animals. It is important to note that each living creature in Revelation has only one face, which is different from the two and four-faced cherubim in Ezekiel. The wheels associated with the cherubim of Ezekiel's vision had eyes like the living creatures of Revelation, but not the cherubim themselves. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 18 Regarding their rims, they were so high that they were awesome and dreadful, and the rims of all four of them were full of eyes all around. The living creatures of Revelation had six wings, which is true of the seraphim, but not like the cherubim who have two or four wings. Revelation chapter 4 verse 8 And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes all over and within, underneath their wings. And day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Omnipotent, the Ruler of all, who was and who is and who is to come, the unchanging eternal God. 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 24 One wing of the cherub was five cubits long, and the other wing was also five cubits long. It was ten cubits from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 21 Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings, and beneath their wings there was the form of human hands. The exact number of cherubim created by God is not known. However, four of them are mentioned in the books of Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5, Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 9, and Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 12. These creatures were commonly used in the decorations of the tabernacle and Solomon's temple. The plural form of cherub suggests that there could have been multiple cherubim created by God, which is further supported by their frequent use in Israel's religious structures. Appearance According to the Bible, cherubim appeared as human-like beings, but not like the winged infants depicted in later art. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 5 Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each had two faces, those of a man and a lion, or four faces on the right, a lion's. On the left, an ox's, 
replaced by a cherub's face in Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 14, an eagle's and a man's. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 14, and each one had four faces. The first face was the face of the cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, and the fourth the face of an eagle. Each cherub had at least two wings, while others had four. In both cases, two wings were used for flying. The four-winged cherubim used the second pair to cover their bodies. They also had human hands under their wings. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 8 Under their wings on their four sides they had human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, the cherubim's legs were straight and not capable of bending, while their feet resembled the sole of a calf's foot. To better understand the cherubim's appearance, scholars have studied the culture of the ancient Near East for additional information. While some have suggested that the cherubim are similar to the Assyro-Babylonian colossi, Egyptian griffins, and other representations, it's important to note that none of these proposed identifications accurately depict the cherubim as they are described in the Bible. Old Testament Decorative Uses Cherubim had significant symbolic meaning in Israel's religious architecture. They were incorporated into the design of the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle at God's creation. Cherubim were also used to decorate Solomon's temple and Ezekiel's vision of the Millennial Temple exhibited them as well. First, Ark of the Covenant. On the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant were placed two cherubim facing one another. The cherubim were made of hammered gold and formed a single piece with a mercy seat, with their wings spread above and overshadowing it. Second, they are used in the tabernacle cherubim were embroidered on ten curtains of white fine twined linen and material of blue, purple, and scarlet. These curtains were 28 cubits by 4 cubits each, and when coupled together, they formed either the outside wall or the undermost covering of the tabernacle tent. A veil made of the same materials was hung between the most holy place and the holy place cherubim were also embroidered on this veil. Third, they are used in Solomon's temple. In the inner sanctuary of Solomon's temple were placed two olive wood cherubim overlaid with gold. 2 Chronicles chapter 5 verses 7 through 9. Then the priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, to the inner sanctuary of the house into the Holy of Holies, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, making a covering above the ark and its carrying poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles of the ark were visible from the front of the Holy of Holies, inner sanctuary, but were not visible from the outside. They are there to this day. 2 Chronicles chapter 3 verses 10 through 14. And in the Holy of Holies, he made two sculptured cherubim and overlaid them with gold. The wingspan of the cherubim was 20 cubits. One wing of one cherub was five cubits, reaching to the wall of the house, and its other wing of five cubits touched the other cherub's wing. The wing of the other cherub of five cubits touched the wall of the house, and its other wing of five cubits touched the wing of the first cherub. The wings of these cherubim extended twenty cubits. The cherubim stood on their feet, their faces toward the holy place, the main room. He made the veil between the holy place and the holy of holies a blue, purple, and crimson colors and fine linen, and embroidered cherubim on it. Fourth, Ezekiel's Temple. 
In the temple foreseen by Ezekiel, cherubim were to be part of the decorative scheme. Carvings of cherubim and palm trees adorned all the walls inside the inner room, the nave, and the entire temple. These cherubim had two faces, one of a man and the other of a young lion, facing in opposite directions. The design of the carvings was such that cherubim and palm trees alternated with each other. This means that on each side of every cherub, there was a palm tree, and vice versa. The most mysterious angel in the Bible, the Ophanim. Origins of the Ophanim. The Ophanim are deeply intertwined with the movements and will of God. When the living creatures moved, the wheels beside them moved. And when the living creatures rose from the ground, the wheels also rose. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 19 Historical Context We read of these angels in the book of Ezekiel. The book of Ezekiel was written during a very tough and challenging time for the Israelites, known as the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BCE. This was when they were taken away from their homeland against their will. During this hard time, when their religion and society were being turned upside down, Ezekiel shared his prophecies and visions, including those about the Ophanim. The depiction of the Ophanim aligns with the broader theme in Ezekiel of God's mobility. In a time when the temple in Jerusalem, seen as God's earthly dwelling, was destroyed, the vision of the Ophanim suggested that God's presence was not confined to any single place but was instead dynamic and omnipresent. What are Ophanim angels? Angels have always been a subject of fascination and curiosity in religious and cultural narratives. Among these celestial beings, the Ophanim holds a special place. By celestial beings, we are simply referring to them as spiritual entities that exist in heaven as part of God's divine order. They are often seen as messengers or servants of God, each with their own distinct roles and characteristics. The term Ophanim originates from Hebrew meaning wheels, which describes their unique representation in the scriptures. Ophanims are unique compared to other types of angels. They are shown as both amazing spiritual beings and mysterious symbols. As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 13. The use of the word wheel is deeply symbolic. In many cultures and religious texts, wheels represent cycles, movement, and continuity. Here, it suggests the dynamic nature of the divine plan and the continuous motion of God's will in the universe. The phrase, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel, indicates that these wheels, often him, were being addressed or commanded. This implies that they are sentient and responsive, playing an active role in the vision and by extension in the divine order. The often him, are closely connected to God's throne, showing they have an important place among heavenly beings. Theologians often see the Ophanim as representing God's omnipresence and the mysterious ways his commands are carried out. They are considered integral to understanding the divine realm and its workings. The term Ophanim is derived from the Hebrew word Ophan, which translates to wheel in English. This name is both literal and symbolic, revealing much about their nature and function. The wheel is a symbol. In the context of the Ophanim, it suggests an ongoing dynamic presence in the execution of divine will. The Ophanim are most notably mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, 
specifically in Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 21, where they are described as wheels within wheels, full of eyes all around. This alone sets them apart from the more familiar depictions of angels with human-like forms and wings. The eyes symbolize knowledge and awareness, suggesting that these angels are all-seeing or omniscient, a trait that aligns with the divine attribute of omnipresence. This scripture is part of a larger vision experienced by the prophet Ezekiel, filled with symbolic imagery and deep spiritual meaning. This part comes in, where Ezekiel describes a vision involving four living creatures and a set of wheels associated with them. These wheels are what the Bible refers to as Ophanim. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel, and all four had the same form, their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 16. These specific verses introduce us to the Ophanim. In these verses, Ezekiel describes his vision of four living creatures. The wheels are described as sparkling like beryl, which are precious gemstone, indicating their divine and impressive nature. They are compared to beryl, a precious stone, which shows they are valuable and pure, just like important heavenly objects. Each wheel looks like it is made of one wheel inside another wheel, showing a complicated and mysterious design. These wheels are not like regular ones, but are special and very impressive. This unusual design indicates that there's something very complex and mysterious about God. It might represent how God's plans have many different parts, and how the spiritual world and the physical world are connected. The design of a wheel inside another wheel can be thought of as a symbol for the complex ways God works, which are usually too difficult for people to fully understand. Also, the wheel's ability to move in any direction without turning, as described in the verses, may symbolize God's ability to be everywhere and know everything their appearance. The living creatures mentioned alongside the wheels appear elsewhere in the Bible. For instance, similar beings are described in Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 8, suggesting a common theme of divine presence and majesty. Also, in front of the throne there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. This scripture provides a detailed and symbolic description of a vision experienced by the Apostle John. This vision, like Ezekiel's vision of the Ophanim, features celestial beings and is rich in details. Let's take a look at the meaning of these verses and their connection to the Ophanim described in Ezekiel. John talks about a throne in heaven, which represents God's powerful and supreme rule. The sea of glass represents a barrier between God and creation, emphasizing His holiness and majesty. The four living creatures John sees are full of eyes and have different forms. A lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. The eyes symbolize awareness and vigilance, 
while the different forms could represent the fullness and diversity of God's creation. These creatures continually praise God, emphasizing His eternal holiness and power. The scene reflects the overwhelming holiness and majesty of God's presence. The diverse forms of the creatures might represent various aspects of God's creation. Strength, lion, service, ox, intelligence, human, and swiftness, eagle. The beings in Revelation constantly serve and praise God, showing how heavenly beings always work for the divine purpose. Both visions convey the nature of God and His divine order. The complex design of the Ophanim and the diverse forms of the creatures in Revelation symbolize different aspects of God's character and the mysteries of His divine plan. In general, the visions in Ezekiel and Revelation are part of a larger theme in the Bible. These books use symbols to express deep spiritual truths and what's happening in heaven. They show us a bit of the spiritual world and how God relates to everything He has made. Both Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 21 and Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 8 make us think about how majestic and mysterious God is. They tell us that God is always there. He rules over everything He has created, and heavenly beings are always worshipping Him. These parts of the Bible invite us to worship God and understand that His plans are big and complex. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Psalm chapter 139 verses 7 through 10. The central theme here is the omnipresence of God. The idea that God is present everywhere and at all times. There is no place in the universe whether it be the heights of heaven or the depths of the grave, where one can escape from God's presence. Connection to the Ophanim The movement of the Ophanim symbolizes God's ability to be present in all places and see all things. The wheel's eyes and their ability to move in any direction without hindrance reflect God's omniscience, all-knowing nature and omnipresence. Just like Psalm chapter 139 says that God is everywhere in the universe, the Ophanim, who can move in any direction, shows that God's presence reaches everywhere. The eyes on the Ophanim's wheels and how they can move in any direction are like what the Psalm says about God's power to see everything and be everywhere. Both this psalm and how the Ophanim are shown make us feel amazed by how big God is and comforted by knowing He is always with us. This mix of amazement and comfort shows a deep spiritual knowledge of what God is like. Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 10 is a passage from the book of Daniel another major prophetic book in the Bible. Similar to Ezekiel's visions, it gives us a peek into the heavenly world, especially showing the greatness and power of God's throne. This part of the Bible is closely related in theme and symbols to Ezekiel's visions of the Ophanim. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. 
The court was seated, and the books were opened. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10. The Ancient of Days, as a title for God, emphasizes his eternal nature. The white clothing and hair symbolize purity and wisdom. The throne of God is depicted as being ablaze, signifying God's consuming power and glory. The mention of wheels aligns with a description of the Ophidim in Ezekiel, suggesting mobility and omnipresence. The river of fire could symbolize the purifying and judging power of God. The huge number of attendants shows how big God's royal court is and how great his power is. Connection to the Ophidim The most direct connection between Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 10 and the vision of the Ophidim in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 21, is the mention of wheels. In Ezekiel, the wheels, often him, are described as complex, moving along with the living creatures. In Daniel, the wheels are part of God's flaming throne, emphasizing the dynamic and powerful nature of God's presence. In both visions of Ezekiel and Daniel, the wheels show that God is actively involved in our world. They show that he can do things and be present in our world while still being a heavenly being. The part in Daniel where thrones are set up and books are open shows that God is the highest judge. The amazing way these visions describe things shows how great, holy, and powerful God is. The impressive and grand way these scenes are described shows that God has the highest power over everything. Both sections of the Bible use strong and meaningful words to make us think about God's characteristics, like being everywhere at once, all-powerful, and acting as a supreme judge. The Ophanim and the Fiery Throne are descriptions that show these qualities helping us understand the deep and sometimes hard to grasp aspects of God. The Bible uses these images to help us picture parts of God that are hard to understand. These visions give us a way to think about God's power and presence, helping us to really appreciate how great and powerful He is. So, when Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 16 describes the Ophanim, it's not just about how they look, but also about their deeper spiritual meaning. This description shows us some of God's special qualities, His magnificence, His presence everywhere, and the mysterious ways He works in the world. Their movement. The wheels of the Ophanim can move in any direction without physically rotating. This might symbolize the omnipresence and omniscience of God, able to move and see in all directions simultaneously. Whenever they moved, they moved in any of their four directions without turning as they moved. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 17. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction, and the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went, and when those stood still, these stood still. And when those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 20 through 21. The movement of the wheels is not random but is directed by the Spirit, indicating divine guidance and purpose. The movement of the wheels is not independent. It's entirely in sync with the living creatures. The term Spirit in the verse is critical. It's the driving force behind the movements of both the creatures and the wheels. In the biblical context, Spirit often refers to the Divine Presence or the Holy Spirit. This suggests 
that the actions of these celestial beings are guided by divine intent. The fact that the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels suggests a deep interconnectedness between the Ophanim and God. It's not just physical proximity, but a profound union, indicating that the movements and actions of these celestial beings are expressions of God's will. Just as the wheels move with the creatures, symbolizing guidance and purpose, our lives can be seen as guided by a higher power or purpose. The idea is key to trusting in God's divine plan, where our paths align with greater intentions beyond our immediate understanding. The concept of divine guidance is common in other parts of the Bible. For example, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Psalm chapter 23, verse 3. This aligns with the fact that Ezekiel was being led by the Spirit. In relation to the Spirit in the wheel of the Ophanim, this scripture emphasizes the theme of divine guidance. Psalm chapter 23, verse 3 speaks of God leading the faithful along righteous paths while Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 20 through 21 describes the Ophanim moving in perfect harmony with the spear, symbolizing divine direction. Righteous path and order in Psalm chapter 23 verse 3 refers to paths of righteousness seen as a metaphor for the right order or divine will, which is also a theme in Ezekiel's vision where the Ophanim move according to the spirit's direction signifying alignment with God's will. The movement of the Ophanim in Ezekiel shows a complete dependence on the spirit for direction, similar to the psalmist trusting God for guidance along the right path. Therefore, the Ophanim as an entity deeply connected to God's divine spirit, moving and existing in perfect harmony with the will of God, does not only give us a glimpse into the complex nature of celestial beings, but also offers a symbolic representation of divine guidance and the interconnectedness of all aspects of God's creation. Just as the Ophanim moves with the Spirit, we are also guided by unseen forces, suggesting a divine presence in our lives, guiding us towards our paths. These verses invite us to reflect on the mysteries of the divine and the ways in which the spiritual realm intersects with our earthly existence. The way the wheels move together with the living creatures shows a strong spiritual connection between what God wants, shown by the creatures, and how that is carried out, shown by the wheels. Connection to Isaiah the extraordinary movement of the wheels in Ezekiel can be seen as a metaphor for this truth. God's ways and movements are beyond human understanding. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 through 9. While not directly referencing the Ophanim, this scripture offers insights that can be related to these celestial beings as described in Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 15 through 21. This implies that there is a vast difference between God's understanding and actions and those of humans. It emphasizes the divine perspective and methods as being far beyond human comprehension. In its broader context, Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 17 about the Ophanim emphasizes a key message about the nature of God and His divine workings. It suggests that God's presence and actions are not as limited or predictable as human actions are. In other words, we are encouraged to recognize and respect the greatness and wonder of God, whose actions and plans are beyond our understanding, and whose presence is everywhere in the world. The Ophanim 
and the nature of God. The nature of God is complex and multifaceted. This complexity is reflected in the attributes and roles of the Alphanim angels. To understand this connection, here are some key attributes of God and how they relate to the Alphanim. Sovereignty. God is the ultimate authority, controlling all events and outcomes. He is not answerable to anyone, and His will is final. The sovereignty of God is the ultimate authority, having complete control over everything in the universe. This idea is strongly linked to how the Alphanim angels are shown in the Bible, particularly in the book of Ezekiel. The sovereignty of God means He is the supreme ruler over all creation. Nothing happens without His knowledge or permission. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases Him. Psalm chapter 115 verse 3. This emphasizes that God's will is paramount and He has the ultimate authority over all things. God's sovereignty also implies that everything happens according to His divine plan and purpose, which reflects the belief that God's purposes will always be fulfilled, despite any human actions. Holiness God is completely pure and set apart from all creation. He is unique in His perfection. The holiness of God is a concept that describes how God is completely pure, perfect, and separate from all that is evil or sinful. In simple terms, it means that God is absolutely good and morally flawless, without any trace of wrong or injustice in Him. God's holiness means He is totally pure and without sin. He represents the highest standard of moral perfection. Holiness also implies a complete separation from anything that is sinful or evil. God is utterly distinct from all forms of corruption. God's actions and decisions are always perfectly just and good. He never does anything wrong or unfair. Because God is holy, He deserves our respect, reverence, and worship. His holiness sets him apart as worthy of complete devotion. God's holiness is about being entirely separate from everything else in creation, especially in terms of purity and moral integrity. The Ophanim's unique appearance sets them apart from other beings, reflecting the otherness and separateness associated with God's holiness. Their proximity to God's throne in Ezekiel's vision signifies their direct service to the Most Holy God. This placement itself is a testament to their participation in the Divine Holiness. The eyes covering the Ophanim suggest a state of perpetual vigilance and awareness of God's all-seeing knowledge, a part of His holy nature. Their ability to move in any direction without turning speaks to the limitless nature of God's power and presence, aspects of His holiness that transcend human understanding. Omnipotence The omnipotence of God refers to His all-powerful nature, meaning God has unlimited power and can do anything that aligns with His nature and character. This concept is fundamental to understanding who God is. I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. Job chapter 42 verse 2. The Ophanim's ability to move in any direction effortlessly symbolizes this limitless power. In other words, omnipotence means there are no limits to God's power. He can create, sustain, destroy, and control all things in the universe. God's power is always consistent with His other attributes, such as His goodness, justice, and holiness. This means He cannot do anything that contradicts His own nature. The Ophanim 
as described in the book of Ezekiel, are a class of celestial beings associated with the throne of God. Are Ophanim's angels? The Ophanim, mentioned in the Bible, are often classified as angels, but their unique characteristics set them apart from the typical depiction of angels. To understand whether the Ophanim are truly angels, we need to explore their biblical description and compare them with the general concept of angels in the Bible. In the Bible, angels are heavenly beings made by God. They are usually shown as God's messengers or helpers, doing what God wants and delivering his messages to people. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14. Ministering spirits suggest that angels are spiritual beings whose primary purpose is to serve. They are not merely passive observers, but active participants in God's plan. The verse specifically states that angels are sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. This indicates that one of their roles is to assist, guide, protect, and provide for the needs of believers or those destined for salvation. Unlike the common portrayal of angels, the Ophanim are described as wheels intersecting each other and covered in eyes. This appearance is unique and does not match the typical winged human form of angels. The Ophanim's role seems to be closely linked to God's throne, which means they have a role in God's presence and carrying out His plans on a larger universe-wide scale. This is a bit different from the usual role of angels who act as messengers or guides for people. Theologians have often debated the exact nature of the Ophanim. Some consider them a distinct class of angels due to their direct service to God, while others view them as a unique type of celestial being separate from angels. Ophanim and the general role of angels. In the broader context, angels are viewed as messengers and servants of God. They act as intermediaries between the divine and the human, carrying out God's will, offering guidance, and providing protection to us. While all angels share this overarching purpose, each class has its specific roles and characteristics that contribute to the celestial hierarchy and the functioning of the universe. In the world of angels, they are grouped into various levels or groups, each having its own special characteristics and role. The Ophanim are one of these groups and are often seen as part of the third level in heaven. They are known as the thrones. Their main job is to carry God's throne and show his fairness and power. This is why the Ophanim is quite unique from the other angels. Seraphim. Often depicted as the highest order, seraphim are associated with surrounding the throne of God, endlessly praising Him. The term seraphim means the burning ones, indicative of their intense love and purity. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 describes them as having six wings, with two covering their face, two their feet, and two they used to fly. The seraphim and Ophanim are both fascinating celestial beings mentioned in the Bible, each with distinct characteristics and roles within the heavenly hierarchy. Cherubim. Another well-known class, cherubim, are depicted as guardians of God's glory. Cherubims are known for their proximity to God and their role in various divine narratives. The cherubim are often described as having multiple faces, wings, and other elements that signify their divine nature and power. Each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 6. 
while cherubim with faces and wings, symbolizing various aspects of creation. The Ophidim have mystical wheels, emphasizing the continuous motion and order of the divine. Cherubim are often seen as guardians and attendants to God's divine presence, whereas the Ophidim are part of the divine chariot, indicating a role in the direct manifestation of God's will. Both cherubim and ophanim are closely associated with the throne of God, but in slightly different ways. With the cherubim, they are often depicted in the Bible as being directly in the presence of God, even supporting His throne. This indicates their high status and intimate relationship with God. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, where their face is one to another, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Exodus chapter 25 verse 20. On the other hand, the Ophanim are part of God's chariot in Ezekiel's vision. This shows that they are near God's throne too, but their role is more about doing God's work and carrying out His plans. Roles and Functions the Ophanim's unique role. They are shown as wheels, which might mean they are related to the idea of God's chariot. This shows how God moves and has power. The eyes on the wheels suggest they are always watching over the world, which fits with the belief that God is everywhere and knows everything. In Ezekiel's vision, the Ophanim show a special and mysterious side of how angels are understood. They are different from seraphim and cherubim, who are mainly seen as angels that worship and protect. The Ophanim appears to show us the way God organizes things and how His plans happen in the world. Importance of the Throne of God The Throne of God is the center of divine authority and power. It's a place from where God's choices, judgments, and plans come out, affecting the whole universe. The throne signifies God's governance over all aspects of creation, both the physical and the spiritual realms. It's a reminder of the order and balance maintained by the divine will. From His throne, God gives out fairness and kindness, it's a place where God's sense of what's right and His caring nature come together, showing us a full picture of who He is. Throughout the Bible, the throne of God is a focal point of worship and praise, acknowledging God's ultimate authority and benevolence. In many biblical visions, the throne is where God's presence is most directly experienced it's often depicted as the center of heavenly activity. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. The throne is also where God dispenses judgment and mercy, highlighting His role as the ultimate judge and redeemer. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 The flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder represent how powerful and majestic God is. This type of description is commonly found in the Bible to show how God's presence is powerful and really amazing. This vision sets the stage for the heavenly worship that follows in the later verses of Revelation chapter 4. The way it's described makes you feel a deep respect and amazement, which is just right for worshiping God. The Ophanim are first introduced in the book of Ezekiel, where they are described in a vision that includes the throne of God. Being bearers of the divine throne, in a religious or a spiritual context, essentially means being responsible for upholding or supporting the presence and authority of God. 
The throne represents God's supreme power and authority. It's a symbol of his rule over the universe. The beings described as bearers of the throne are seen as upholding, supporting, or accompanying this divine authority. They are often depicted as playing a crucial role in maintaining the order and execution of God's will. While the book of Ezekiel doesn't explicitly use the term bearers of the divine throne for the Ophanim, their close proximity to God's presence implies a role in supporting or symbolizing His authority. In Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 26 through 28, the prophet describes a vision of God's throne. And above the expanse over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne in appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire around within, from the appearance of his loins upward. And from the appearance of his loins downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and there was brightness around him. Here, the throne is shown as a grand and amazing symbol that represents God being present. The vision begins with Ezekiel seeing something that resembled a throne made of sapphire. In ancient times, sapphire was a highly valued gemstone, known for its deep blue color. It was often associated with royalty and divine favor. The use of sapphire in the vision symbolizes majesty, beauty, and the preciousness of the divine throne. In biblical symbolism, blue was often associated with the divine and with heaven. The sapphire, known for its deep blue color, strengthens this link and makes the vision feel more heavenly and beyond the ordinary world. Ezekiel uses sapphire, a stone we know for mirth, to describe God's throne making it easier for us to picture. But this heavenly throne is much more splendid than anything on earth, showing that God's world is way more amazing than anything we can think of or experience. This throne is positioned above the heads of the living creatures, possibly cherubim, described earlier in the chapter. The throne symbolizes God's sovereignty and divine authority. On the throne, Ezekiel sees a figure that resembles a man. This description is significant, as it represents God in a way that's relatable to humans. Though it's understood that this is a mere representation and not a physical likeness of God. The figure is described as glowing like metal, full of fire from the waist up, and like fire from the waist down. This imagery of fire and brilliant light signifies God's purity, power, and the overwhelming intensity of His presence. The appearance of a rainbow, symbolizing hope, promise, and the continuity of God's covenant with humanity. The rainbow adds a sense of beauty and peace to the otherwise awe-inspiring and intense vision. Ezekiel's response to this vision is to fall face down, a common reaction in the Bible when individuals are confronted with the supernatural power of God. It reflects humility, reverence, and the overwhelming impact of encountering God's glory. The passage concludes with Ezekiel hearing the voice of God, indicating that this vision is not just about seeing God's glory, but also about receiving his message. Those referred to as bearers of the divine throne are seen as essential in upholding and manifesting God's will and authority. They are integral to the maintenance of divine order. The role is often understood symbolically. Ophanim today. Ophanim has had a big impact on art books, and popular culture. Their description in the book of Ezekiel has led to many different kinds of art about them, from old religious paintings to today's digital images. 
This has helped change how people in Western culture think of angels. In ancient religious art, they were often depicted in accordance with Ezekiel's vision, emphasizing their otherworldly and mysterious nature. This portrayal challenged the conventional depiction of angels as human-like figures with wings. Instead, artists explored more abstract and symbolic representations, highlighting the divine mystery and omnipresence associated with the Ophanim. In modern times, this influence extends to digital art and visual media. The Ophanim have been pictured in many different ways, from dreamy and symbolic styles to more realistic drawings of wheels and eyes. This change in how they are shown in art shows both a lasting interest in these beings and a wider effort to creatively express spiritual ideas. The impact of the Ophanim goes beyond just art. In books and stories, these angels have encouraged authors to write about topics like godliness, mysterious spiritual truths, and otherworldly phenomena. In popular culture, the Ophanim have appeared in various forms, from characters in fantasy novels and films, to motifs in video games and graphic novels. These representations mix classic ideas from the Bible with modern views, attracting many people and making them more interested in the mysterious parts of studying angels. In conclusion, the Ophanim angels are very interesting and significant in both religious and cultural settings. They represent a special mix of mystery and deep respect. The way the Ophanim are described in the Bible especially in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, with their unique look and mysterious purpose, helps us better understand the order of heaven and also adds to our culture and art. The picture of wheels within wheels full of eyes goes beyond mere visual representation, symbolizing vigilance and divine omniscience. The influence of the Ophanim is felt in religious studies and everyday culture. They usually represent the incredible complexity and beauty of what God has created and how everything is organized. The reason they are still important in both religious and popular contexts is that they make us feel wonder and think deeply. They encourage us to think about the huge and complex spiritual world that is connected to our own reality. This intriguing blend of the mystical and the tangible makes the Ophanim a captivating subject, continually inviting us to explore the deeper meanings and implications of their presence in our spiritual narrative. Let us pray. Dear Lord, right now, we are here with open hearts and open minds asking for the wisdom and guidance that your special angels, the Ophanim, represent so well in your great plan. We are humbled by the majesty of the Ophanim, those magnificent creatures of your creation, whose very existence speaks of your glory and power. Like they constantly move around your throne with never-ending loyalty, let it remind us of our ongoing journey towards your never-ending love and kindness. Lord, in our daily lives, filled with challenges and uncertainties, we often find ourselves at a crossroads, unsure of which path to take. Grant us, we pray, the wisdom of the Ophanim, to see beyond the immediate, to discern your will in the midst of life's complexities. Like the Ophanim, who move effortlessly in any direction, help us to navigate our lives with the same grace and agility, always moving towards your light. We ask for the courage to face our trials and tribulations with the same unyielding faith as the Ophanim. In moments of doubt and fear, Remind us that just as these celestial beings are covered in eyes, 
you too are ever watchful over us. May this knowledge comfort us, knowing that we are never alone and that your loving gaze is always upon us. The Alphanim are beautiful and amazing in their own special way, showing us how creative you are. Help us to see and value the different kinds of beauty in the world and in ourselves. Let us realize and be thankful for the special abilities and talents you have given us. May we use these gifts to honor you and to help others with kindness and humbleness. Lord, as the Ophanim are ever in motion, so too are our lives constantly changing. In times of change and transition, be our steady hand. Guide us with your wisdom, that we may embrace the new paths you lay before us with confidence and peace, trusting in your plan for our lives. We draw inspiration from the Ophanim's role as bearers of your throne, a reminder of your omnipresence in our lives. May we always carry your presence within us, radiating your love and light to all we encounter. Help us to be ambassadors of your peace, bringing comfort and hope to those in need. In moments of stillness and contemplation, let us feel the presence of the Ophanim, encouraging us to delve deeper into our relationship with you. May our prayers and meditations ascend to you like sweet incense, a testament to our devotion and love for you. Finally, Lord, we pray for the unity and harmony that the Ophanim represent. In a world often divided, let their example remind us of the importance of working together for the common good, respecting and valuing each other, despite our differences. May their ceaseless praise of your glory inspire us to live in constant gratitude, praising your name in all circumstances. We thank you, Lord, for the mystery and beauty of the Ophanim angels and for the lessons they impart upon us. May their example guide us, their wisdom enlighten us, and their devotion inspire us to draw ever closer to you. In your holy name we pray, amen.